Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Jess Hilarious, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got some special guests in the building. We have Mario and Mandela Van Peebles. Welcome. Hey, man. Good to be here. How's it feeling? How y'all feeling? Good, man. It's a little cold, but we're happy to be here. Okay. I'm old enough to remember when it was uh, Melvin and Mario. Yeah. That was Mario and yeah. Mandela. <laughs> <laughs> it, should, it keep going. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You know, it's interesting. The other day I looked up and I realized, I was telling Mandela this, my father gave me my first lines ever in a feature film. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then I gave him his last lines ever in a feature film. Wow. And I was like, this is a trippy circle. Like, mm -hmm. how many people get that in their lives? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And when I did Posse 30 years ago? 30, 31 yeah. years ago? Yeah. 31 years ago. Yeah, right. I didn't have kids, and, and, but I had my dad. And then this time when I did Outlaw Posse, I didn't have my dad, but I got Mandela. That's right. Wow. So I'm like the connective tissue. Absolutely. You know? so, so is, is uh, Outlaw Posse the unofficial sequel or official sequel it's to Posse? Not, no, it's, it's a Western. Okay. It's just, you know, like Clint Eastwood did a bunch of spaghetti Westerns. It's a different Western. It's gotcha. not really. But it is... Uh, a, a multi culty wild ass group of cowboys and cow women, I guess mm -hmm. you would say, mm -hmm. uh, differently than before. So it's you know before we had like like an out in posse we had Big Daddy Kane and Tone and Woody Strode and mm -hmm. the Hudlin Brothers and Blair Underwood and Sally Richardson and big cast mm -hmm. that's the and this time we've got um, who we got Cedric the Entertainer get to the mic boy Cedric we got DC Youngfly we got Whoopi Goldberg. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. She didn't. I didn't cast Whoopi. Whoopi cast herself. Okay, talk like, to us about yeah, that. Like, yeah, I'm happen. playing this role. Okay. Um, I was shooting something for Riza, Wu Tang Clan, mm -hmm. American Saga, next door in Jersey, to where Whoopi lives. So she came over like, "What's all this racket?" And then we met, <laughs> and I. She said, "I've always wanted to do a western." I said, "I got this script I'm doing," and she said, "Stage coach Mary, stage coach Mary," and that's how that came about. Really? Wow. Yeah. And we just. It's one of those things where you meet someone like we meet you, and just like mm -hmm. I want to do it, and then I'm really one of those guys. I will really call you up and mm -hmm. be like, "Okay, here's the dates. Let's go." And she's like, "I'm there, Montana. What are we doing?" Wow. And because a lot of folks don't know that almost one out of three cowboys was black. You know, you look at the the old westerns, you don't see that because we basically they call black men boys as a derogatory term. Mm -hmm. So, and we got the the harder jobs, the dirty jobs. So it's like. Take care of the horses, boy. Take care of the cowboy. So once they said cowboy, that's where the name came from. Mm -hmm. White guys like being called rough riders. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so once the Hollywood glorified cowboys, they flipped it up and they had they didn't have us playing them. Kind of like you know we know the high heavyweight champs look like Jack Johnson, Ali, mm -hmm. Tyson, but they'll make them look like Rocky in Hollywood. So mm -hmm. it's just one of those things. So really, when you look at Outlaw Posse, you'll see like real history. Where you'll see some of the real characters in the movie, and the movie you'll see. Oh, I thought that guy was made up. No, this is we based the whole look on this dude. So you'll wow. see the real people at the end, and you'll see how, with Whoopi Goldberg how close she gets to Stagecoach Mary. So. What, what's the significance of Stagecoach Mary's inclusion in the film? Yeah, um, well, well, she is. You know, she has her own Stagecoach line mm -hmm. that she ran up through Montana, had a mm -hmm. big old cigar and a big old shotgun. And in the movie, there comes a point where uh, Edward James almost is in the movie, mm -hmm. and our posse. And this knucklehead's with me in the posse, but I don't know he's a spy. <laughs> Look oh, at him. no Boy, spoilers, man. No, okay. <laughs> I don't know he's a spy. March, March 1st, I love Posse come out. <laughs> <laughs> watch it March 1st. You're going to give away the whole thing. No, I ain't going to give away the whole thing. I get it. But, it, okay, I'm going to tell you one thing. There's a scene where we go in to buy some dry goods. We've just had a bank robbery go wrong. All kind of stuff has gone wrong. So we go in He's like, Dad, come no, on. No, 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 hold up. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving a little, little fractional stuff. All right. So they, we go into to the dry goods store and Edward James almost comes out with his gun. He's like, what y'all here for? And we go in there and when we come out, all the horses are gone mm. and we're in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And he starts cracking up. We're like, why are you laughing, man? He's like, because the originals, they don't believe, the originals are the in Indians. Mm -hmm. He said, they don't believe that, God, that we have the right to own any of God's creatures. But before you get mad, my wife was born enslaved. Those same Native Americans set my wife free. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it was starts to used to, so we lose all our horses and we got to hitch a ride with none other than stage coach Mary. Mary. There you go. Gotcha. That's how it fits. Uh, no, I didn't give away too much, did I? That was a lot. No, yeah, that, that was, was a lot. lot. That was, that was, that was, the movie's only nine minutes. About five minutes. pages of the script. <laughs> now, now, how was working with your dad? Uh, it's, it's good. I had a lot of practice being to the mic, to the mic, to the mic. <laughs> he had a lot See, of practice yeah, being a yeah, it, it's it's fun. Um, obviously, 
I've been his son for a while now, so just doing it <laughs> on camera. We don't. I don't know if he looks like. I don't know. He just followed me around, asked for shit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, but we we have we have a relationship that luckily we uh, we get to wear different hats, and this time we got to wear some cowboy hats mm -hmm. and, and shoot some guns. And what's what's cool actually working with him at a work thing. Usually he's directing or acting, but this time he got to do both. Mm. And so he's directing and acting, and I'm also playing his son. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty rare one. When we work together, yeah. sometimes you're behind, I'm yeah. in front. or Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's, what's cool is that he can ride. He's, he's a cowboy. He, can, he, he did all his own stunts. Mm. You not only, when you're doing a, like, because Outlaw Posse is a, a mean-ass independent, so it's not like you're going to see a lot of billboards or anything. Mm -hmm. It's more word of mouth, right? Mm -hmm. And we just won Best Feature at the uh, Pan-African. Thank you. So when you do a, a feature like this, you really rely on people to do a lot of, it's not CGI, it's not AI, it's real guy. So when he rides in, not only does he have to, I have to get along with him, but with his horse. Cause there's a lot of scenes where he's got to race in and we do it in one shot. So he'll race in on his horse and he got to save dad. You know what I mean? And, and the thing about working with your son like this is we didn't have to fake the love. So when you look mm -hmm. at it on camera, like we clown and play together, mm -hmm. we don't have to fake the love. And so, the, so you're going in with people that really get it and know their roles, and that's that's fun. That all the actors know how to handle and ride horses. Or if they didn't, like, like DC had to go to cowboy. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask yeah, you, okay. DC's yeah, from yeah, Atlanta, right? And, no doubt. And I don't no know doubt. if he, he was on a horse like yeah, that, like yeah, that. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he had to get on a horse. <laughs> me, just because he's from the <laughs> south, you think we rode horses? <laughs> no, you know they have horses in Atlanta. <laughs> he said, I know have, he was on a horse like nah, that. because they like have that. brothers out there that ride on Atlanta and horses in Atlanta. But he was he was at the he was at the screening. And I asked him, how many times have you rode since? He was like, oh, I got a horse now. Oh, he does? See, he got a horse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, he had to, and, and uh, Cedric, Cedric didn't have to ride. So Cedric's in there. And, uh, oh, and Alan Payne. Alan Payne can ride mm -hmm. from New Jack City, of mm -hmm. course. So mm -hmm. I was like calling up all my old connects. Come on out. Let's do it. And it was mad fun. Are you, are you still, you mentioned Alan Payne. Are you still surprised at the influence of New Jack City it, across generations? It's a trip. In fact, we played with it. I'm not going to say nothing. Don't look at me. <laughs> Don't look at a little fake ass fur collar thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, no, I, no. Am I surprised? Yeah, I was surprised. Here's the thing. You know, in most gangster films, you, you emotionally connect with the gangster, mm -hmm. right? That's easy. I mean, that's, it's easy to get to. The trick in New Jack was to not make the crime victimless by having the audience connect up with the victim. So I was two guys I was looking at. One was named Martin Lawrence and one was named Chris Rock to play the victim. And when that's what the trick was to say, okay, we see the cost to our community of this stuff. When people watch New Jack City, yeah, they they they, they look at West, that's the, that's the badass character, but they also look at the cops too. You know, mm -hmm. you had good role models to say yes to because if you want folks to say no emotionally, you better have some role models to emotionally say yes to, mm -hmm. right? You feel me? But in the middle to have the victim get addicted to crack and we deglamorize the heck out of it. You know, so you see him in the alleyway, well, nothing cute about that. Mm -hmm. So I've had people come up to me after seeing it and said, Man, I love the movie. I never wanted to touch no crack after seeing New Jack City. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things that I was proud of is trying to not just entertain us, and that's the thing with Outlaw Posse, but edutain us. And Mandela can tell you, yeah, you could tell him that there's a lot of stuff in Outlaw Posse that's really relevant today. Mm -hmm. You know, we're so divided as a country, they say right now, because some of us watch MSNBC, CNN, and they watch Fox News or whatever, and we have different facts. But we all hopefully come together and watch a Western. We made this gumbo with love. So I quoted yeah. New Jack City. I was on uh, uh, This Week uh, uh, ABC with Jonathan Carl yeah, uh, Sunday. And I quoted New Jack City. What's the quote? I said, because uh, I was talking about how, you know, the vice president, she needs to pivot and start, you know, speaking up more. And I was like, you know, I know that historically the role of the vice president is just to parrot the president. But I was just like, yo, for New Jack, for New Jack problems, we need New Jack uh, New solutions. solutions. New Jack solutions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we're in a different time with that. Yep. And and you can't, you can't come at it, you know, you, you got to come at it ready. And th and this that's the other reason I wanted to do out La Posse now is that there's a whole scene where we go in there and and we deal with some voting right issues. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's stuff you'll find in Outlaw Posse where it's like, oh wow, that's happening right now. Yeah, you know, voting right, uh, even environmental stuff. Right. I don't want to give the spoilers away. You really got to check it out until mm -hmm. March 1st. Yeah. You know, I, 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 we're seeing a lot more Westerns with black casts. What about that time period should black people be 
tapping into? Like, what should we be learning from that time period? Well, I think, well, I think there was a, a big sense, you know, because it was after, look, one of the things that comes up is that in, in 1863, up until then, because we, we do a scene with Whoopi on the stagecoach, mm-hmm. and uh, she looks at him and she says, boy, you know, you're lucky. You're the first generation of black men that legally gets to have a black father. Because until 1863, you couldn't have a black father legally. The, the slave master made all the decisions for the kids. You had nothing to do with it. In fact, mm-hmm. they sell your, your ass somebody else, somewhere else. Wow. So she said, you know, so we've only wow. had since 1863 to get our father game on. Make it 1865 if you're in Texas, right? So we bring up some interesting points. I think one of the things we can learn from the Western is that there was still this sense of do for self. Yes, some of us were lucky enough to go across the country in covered wagons. Other of us had to wrap some canvas around our feet and walk. You know what I mean? The other thing is that I think, and something Mandela mentioned, is that, you know, what's interesting is that the Native American folk and the African folk had a respect for nature, mm-hmm. right? It was only the colonizer was sort of saying, oh, no, just chop, chop down all those trees, kill all the buffalo, do this, commodify it, sell it, chop it up, package it, kill it, wrap it up. And once you, once you imitate the people that would buy and sell you, what have you become? Mm-hmm. Mm. And so you kind of look back and go, wait a minute, we don't have to imitate the people that would buy and sell us. And when you look at that and you realize, wow, a lot of us, there were, there were enslaved folks who ran away with the Native Americans and became known as the Black Seminoles. Mm-hmm. You know? Now, historically, in a movie, they'd be played as white guys. Mm-hmm. We're not doing that. You know, we, we're showing everybody. So I think one of the, uh, you can look back and see, I, I think it's this, if you don't know where you were, it's hard to know where you're going. That's right. Right? So having an idea of your history, you go, oh, we overcame that before. We dealt with Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Okay, we, we, we deal with reparations. We know what's going on. You know, reparations really were supposed to go to us, but they, they gave reparations. They just gave them to the slave, slave owners, owners. Yeah. for loss of property. That comes up in outlaw policy. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Why was it important to, for the film to reflect the diversity of the of the Wild Wild West? Uh, there's a great quote by King Al Messup where he says, "We either all learn to live together as brothers and sisters, and mm-hmm. we all perish together as fools." And I think once you go, "Oh wow, the Chinese brothers and sisters they built the railroad," you know, we built everything. Uh, the Native Americans were here. The, the border moved across Mexico. You know, once you realize we all had a part in it, mm-hmm. then you take a different pride in it. And you're not just fighting for the America you've been. Maybe you're fighting for the America we still can be. Mm. And we have an election year coming up. So my hope is that if you make film, like New Jack, but film that makes people think, maybe they think when they order food. Maybe they think when they uh, drive a car. Maybe they think when they vote. Why do you no. think it's still difficult to make films? I mean, I, I've seen, I think I interviewed and said it was so difficult to make New Jack City back in the day, and, and this is an independent film. Is it still very difficult for a black director to get things done and, and get the money to get the, you know, the, the, the necessary promotion and to get the necessary funding? Is it still very difficult? Well, here's the thing. Uh, I made a, a, a movie a couple years ago called Badass mm-hmm. about my dad. I don't know if y'all saw that, uh, where he made Sweetback. And he made Sweetback at a time when, you know, there was no black leads in movies. Mm -hmm. You couldn't even have facial hair as a black man in a movie. And he made Sweetback and he found an unknown group named Earth, Wind & Fire to do the soundtrack. And that movie became a big hit. And then after that, Hollywood made, they said, well, we want to do some more of those. So they made, they had a movie written by two Jewish guys, well-written movie, and, and they said, let's do it in black. And that became Shaft. And they got Isaac Hayes, who was 24 wow. years old from Stack's record. Wow. And then after that, they had Superfly. Now, what the Black Panthers said about Sweetback was Sweetback made being a revolutionary hip and made going up against the man and the status quo hip. Shaft, cool movie, imitated the icing, but not necessarily the cake because that movie makes working with the man hip. Mm. And then Superfly made dealing drugs against your own people for the man hip. So the Panthers maintain that the icings look cool, same, you know, good looking brother, Mm -hmm. flashy clothes, good soundtrack, but the revolutionary core of the cake was being drained out. Mm. Similar thing happened with hip hop, Mm -hmm. right? You may start off saying the revolution won't be televised or fight the power, but at a certain point when the corporations or the corpses get involved, the content gets drained out. So 
All that to say, if you're the kind of filmmaker or the kind of hip hop artist, whatever, the kind of artist that just wants to do what they tell you to do, you can get the funding. But if you want to make a movie like Outlaw Posse that says, nah, man, <laughs> you're going to see us a different way. You're going to see some badass women because they were here. Mm -hmm. You're going to see some badass brothers because one out of three cowboys was black. The guy who inspired me to make my first Western really was Eastwood. I did a movie called Heartbreak Ridge with Eastwood. Mm -hmm. right? So, and he, in Unforgiven, he put Morgan Freeman in there. Literally, it was almost like one out of three cowboys was black. So I wanted to, to do what, the kind of movies that I want to do. Not all the time. Sometimes I just want to make the money, okay? Mm -hmm. For real. But, but sometimes when, I, when it's all about the heart, I want to make a movie that says something. And when you got to do that, if I take their money, if you take McDonald's money, you can't make Super Size Me. You feel right. me? If I take the studio's money, then I have to do the studio line. I wanted this movie to be Outlaw Posse to be real and gritty and use people that could play the roles and say the stuff we wanted to say that was happening there that we usually just whitewash. And we're at a point in history, right, where you you know they're what they what are they calling slaves now? Enslaved people? Uh in in unpaid workers. Unpaid workers or something, yeah. 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 So they're 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 taking it. it Look, it used to be illegal to teach a black person to read, mm -hmm. and now it's going to be illegal to read about an enslaved person. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're getting to a weird place mm -hmm. where we need to look at our history and go, okay, we did this before. We're all here. Make the gumbo with love. Build it, and they will come. And that's not a movie that necessarily is going to get financing easily. I guess, I guess that's also the beauty of a movie like New Jack City, because when you talk about how people didn't want to you know, um, use crack, it makes you not want to sell it either. Right. When you see somebody oppressing their own people in that way. And you if your see... consciousness is there. See, yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. You, you have a different consciousness. Mm -hmm. Depending on what you, what consciousness you have, that's the level of movie you'll see. Mm -hmm. Do you feel me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, and that's the same thing, same thing with Outlaw Posse. Depending on your level of consciousness, you're going to go, Oh wow, I tuned into that. Mm -hmm. But somebody else, you know, might just tune into something else. You know, so it's it's your consciousness is clearly there because I would look at that and go, yeah, everyone in New Jack that touched crack died. Yeah, right, absolutely, everyone. And but for some people, it was like, well, we don't see an option. We got to make our way out of no way. But you got to figure out a better way. Yeah. Especially if you're oppressing all those people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're ruining yeah, the whole community. At, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what they call it, a self-cleaning oven. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when you look at a, at a Western like this, you know, we, this is, this is, you know, we, we, this is, takes place in 1908. What's going on in 1908? This brother finally got a chance to be the heavyweight champ and he whooped everyone's ass. Mm -hmm. And his name was Jack Johnson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. happening in 1908. Before women could vote, there's a sister named Stagecoach Mary, got her own stagecoach line. She said, if they can make money off me, I can make money off me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do my own thing. You know what I mean? And then you have the the, the fictional characters of us. Mm -hmm. So you got this crazy father and son, and I don't know why what his real motivation for writing me, with me is, but it comes out in the course of the movie. But don't, don't trust his ass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know the dynamic between Chief and Angel in the movie represent like the interplay between good and evil, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, our, our morality and justice. How, how does that dynamic add to the story? Well, it's it, it, that's a real layered one, man, because um, he, uh, the cat that plays uh, Angel is named William Maypothers. Mm -hmm. First of all, what I wanted and was important for this was to have really smart actors that I wanted, that if you looked at them, they weren't just playing a role. You You could believe they knew a lot about it. And so this cat that I wanted with Angel, he's, he doesn't really think of himself as the bad guy. He's just he, you know, he's just grown up feeling like an entitled guy, mm -hmm. like it's all for him. Mm -hmm. This country mm -hmm. is built for me. Mm -hmm. Women can't vote. Hispanics can't vote because we have the Mexican American War. Mm -hmm. Chinese can't vote. We've got the Chinese Exclusion Act. You know what I mean? Uh, they they do all these this trickology to keep you from voting, just like they do now, just like they're doing in Georgia and they're going to do in Florida. Mm -hmm. You know, we've campaigned in Florida. We know what that's about. So it's kind of, the, the French have a saying, la plus ça change, la plus ça, la, la plus ça reste même. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see some of that in the movie and go, oh, sweat, that's like what's happening right now. But the character, the bad guy, the, the, the antagonist, um, is a guy that believes America's only for him. And... When the we rob a bank and we rob a bank, do some crazy stuff. DC Youngfly gets to rob a bank. I'm gonna give away one thing. 
<laughs> Got one thing, Mandela, come on. He robs a bank and he's in disguise. No, I'm not going to tell him what the yeah, disguise okay, is. Okay. okay. We've seen the disguise on, on the trailer. No, you haven't. Okay, all right. I don't think you have. Okay, okay. Maybe you have. That wasn't the minstrel show. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, okay. But he, he, he yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. but it, it goes. Give it away. All okay, right, all right, it, it goes further than that. It goes, all right, all right. So we rob a bank, and then the sheriff is totally befuddled when he comes out. He says, "Man, black and white in cahoots together, working together. Who could have seen that happening?" And so, in the course of our movie, the, the outlaw's strength is their diversity. Mm-hmm. America, part of America's strength is our diversity. You know, good allies come in our all colors, yeah, man. Yeah, you can't you can't stereotype people. No, yeah, you, you can't know, say, those it, the criminals right there. No, but, no, no, yeah. no, no. Good allies come in all yeah, colors, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the maturity when you go. Oh, it's not. It's something Malcolm came came to realize too. Mm-hmm. It's not not your skin color. It's where your heart is. You know. So I'm kind of touching on what you said. get to that though. microphone, son. What you mentioned though, good and evil, that that kind of dynamic at play. I was just thinking about that. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that evil is represented by the law-abiding angel. Yes. And then the good is the outlaws. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah. and, and, and that goes to our tagline, which says, you know, slavery was legal. That's right. Not allowing women to vote was legal. Was, was legal. legal. Yeah. Right? Jim Crow, legal. legal right? yeah. Destroying nature, still legal. Yeah. When the laws are unjust, the just are outlawed. Like Roe v. Wade now. Roe v. Wade now, exactly. Do you know what I mean? So the laws really are more about who has the power versus Mm -hmm. what's just and what's correct. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And so we we come into a place in this movie where we we have the choice of just going for the gold or stopping to to correct a couple uh, things, some injustices Mm -hmm. on the way. I didn't say nothing. <laughs> Relax. He can't, he can't help himself. He yeah. can't help himself. But he wanted to watch just... the movie with you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want to know. Stop, 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 stop. Look at that. I'll be like the dude in the back at 40 News Street hollering at the screen. <laughs> I was going to ask. Hollering at my own screen. <laughs> why did you decide a, a major movie as opposed to a Netflix or streaming service? Because I like sit. Here's the thing. When you watch TV, TV is small and man is big. When you watch a movie, man is small. Movies big, and I like I like to sit up. There. Plus, when you watch a movie, you paid some money to sit in the movie. You put your devices down, you put your toys down. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean. You pick your popcorn up, mm-hmm. and if the movie doesn't suck, you stay right in there and you get into it, mm-hmm. and you're engaged in it. I love that. It is I very hard to watch movies at home. Yeah, like I don't know why we think that's a good thing. Like, right. cause you're just too distracted. Well, mm-hmm. you know, and plus I'm the kind of dude I'd be like, I'll be shut up, shut up. I want to see it mm-hmm. unless it's a comedy. Then I like to go see it right straight in the hood. We live right. Right, good in the hood. So mm-hmm. I'll go right down this. Okay, I know. Mm-hmm. I know. I'm part of the audience is going to be part of the movie. That's right. You know, there's mm-hmm. always that joke at the top. In fact, we when we we just played at the Pan African uh, Outlaw Posse, and it was certain lines you couldn't hear because people was talking to the screen. It was fun, mm-hmm. you know. So some of that interactive thing, we we watch film kind of like we interact with art, and whereas some cultures have grown up being reverential with art. You know, like a museum or something. Yeah. You get all in there, touch it, take a photo. It's like walking down the street in New York. It's like white folks recognize me and they're kind. They can't have a picture. Black folks, they're related to you. Come on, no, shut up. You better take your picture. <laughs> hey, get a zoom. Get a get a vote. <laughs> you know, so there's a different. That's a different quality. That's right. Do, do you know what I mean? You, you talk about allyship. I wonder how does the allyship of stagecoach Mary. <laughs> <laughs> contribute to the development of, of, of Chief and other characters. Right. Well, the see, well, f- there was a lot of issues, right? One was that one of her rules was, you're going to ride on my stagecoach. you got to stow your weapon. Mm. So that was all already dealing with, you know, Western. We lost our horse at a certain point. We got to get him back. And I got to stow my weapon. It's like, wait a minute, that's some Second Amendment type mm-hmm. stuff. It's like, well, you want to be on my stagecoach. Mary's stagecoach, Mary's rules, you know? And and then she asks me, she says, do you remember your dad, your pop, after she talks to him? Mm-hmm. And I say, yeah, man, he t- they, they, they hung him for trying to teach me to read. And then they told me to call some old white priest father and the slave owner master. And they said, by law, I had to take the master's last name. So I knew with all them bullshit laws, I was gonna grow up to be an outlaw for sure. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of knowledge that mm-hmm. Whoopi drops that, mm-hmm. that sort of prompts her. You go, you think about stuff and you go, wow. That white folks need to hear too. Black folks need to hear. But we go, wow, that makes total sense. You know, when you lay it out like that, it's like, remember the beginning of Posse? 
In the beginning of Posse, Woody Strode, who was the first brother I saw in a Western that didn't shuffle, Woody Strode says, history's a funny thing. Mm. They got us thinking Columbus discovered America. But there was already people here. Yeah, people here. Yeah. That's like me putting my flag on your car and saying, get out your car, I'm gonna call you an evil red savage. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when you look, when you break down the, the whole origin story of this country, you really see it's a really all-inclusive story. Mm -hmm. And it's still a wonderful country. And still, we, can, we got all this crazy potential. There's a lot. So I'm, again, the, the, the character towards the end says, I'm fighting for the America we can be, not just the America we've been. Mm -hmm. you know? I love the quote uh, in the film, Angel says to Willis that religion is the story we tell ourselves about the future. Right. History is the story we tell about the past and it's told by those in power. Right. Expound on that. Yeah, man. Well, th thank you for noticing that. That was mm -hmm. something, I wrote that line with Melvin in my head. Mm -hmm. My daddy used to say, history's a book written by the winner, mm. right? And so once you understand that, you go, oh, so they're telling you a history that uh, sets up how they want you to be. Mm. You know, Frantz Fanon says, the, the best colonizers always left behind the churches and the schools so that they could socialize the oppressed to the oppressor's point of view, mm. right? and that one good priest could do the work of a hundred soldiers. You know? So the thing is, you gotta read to learn. I mean, you gotta learn to read, but then you gotta read to learn. And when you really start to read your own books and you read mm -hmm. the biography of Malcolm and you read the history of Ethiopia and you understand how they, do, they beat back the Italians and were never colonized. We don't learn about that history. Mm -hmm. you know, the Battle of Adwa, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and you learn about the West and you go, oh wow, you mean Jack Johnson then went off, you got a white wife and him and his white wife opened up a club called Black and Tan where f folks of all colors were welcome. I didn't know that, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? I didn't know that, I mean, that you just learn so much and when you learn it, you can't help but go, wow, we were here, we were doing our thing. That's right. So lines like that where you say, it's a book written by the winner, we really all can be winners. It doesn't have to be replacement like, okay, if we, if if you, you win and then I'm naturally losing, that's, that's, that's not correct. We can actually win together, you know. And actually, you tell it, the white people that it, it, right. Mm -hmm. it, it, and and yeah. I got white people in my family for mm -hmm. real. I got white, gay. I even got a trumper in my family, so I got love with open arms. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's why, even in New Jack City, man, I mix it up. I paint with all the colors when I make a movie. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make reactionary film or do unto them like they've done unto us. I want to do unto them as I'd like them to do unto us, mm -hmm. but also do unto them in a real way. That quote so, also shows that. Uh, Basically, like the narrative of history can be manipulated or shaped by whoever is in the position of power. Totally. And that's Ab what's happening now. I absolutely. Mean, I mean, I was just in Cartagena, Colombia. We went to a part called Palenque. I never heard of it before. Brother, everyone looks like us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you go, they just don't sound like us. Mm -hmm. You know, so you go there and be, brother come up to you, hey, get on the get the go. You know, you're like, whoa, what, what are you saying, brother? And you realize we always, all of us are speaking the colonizer's languages. We don't know our own languages. We don't know mm -hmm. our name. But in Palenque, they, they have this area where all the freed slaves went. And finally, Spain had to cut a deal with them because they were so strong and they couldn't be beaten. They said, we'll let you have your freedom under one condition. You have to keep a white church in the center of your town. <laughs> Damn. And it was like so clear. It was like, if you keep our white deity, we will leave you alone. We'll Damn. let you. You know, so when you really look at that, you go, wow, wow. You know what I mean? The, 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 the most, listen, this is the, one of the last conversations I had with my dad mm -hmm. uh, was, he said, the modern day colonizer doesn't put chains on your body. The chains are on your mind. That's right. The first step to freeing your mind is to control your own imagery. The image of what you can be, the image of what you think you can be. Mm -hmm. If you look at a, a Western and go, you mean I could be a cowboy? I could be in the West? I could be this, I could be, I could do whatever. That sets you free, your imagination free. And this man grew up, Mandela grew up seeing his granddad and his dad as, as cowboys. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's a, that's a real dope freedom to have. Did you have to audition for this, Mandela? For years, right? <laughs> <laughs> you knew what I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I was, I was, a little bit privy to it as it was still in the writing process. Mm -hmm. So it, it's something that he knows I have a love for horses and all things nature. So I think it was kind of in the back of his mind. It was written for you. 
I wouldn't say for me, but I would be pretty mad if someone else was playing his son. <laughs> <Right. Right. laughs> and the thing is, he, this guy can act his ass off. He's mm -hmm. in that show, Reginald the Vampire. He plays a, a Black Panther who was turned into a vampire because the the arc of history does bend towards justice, but it takes too long. So if you're a vampire, you're around. And he was, you were the, um, what was that? Mayor of Kingston? Mayor of Kingston, yeah, yeah so with uh, Jeremy Renner. Yeah. yeah, so he's doing a lot of acting. So it wasn't just like, I picked him up. Listen, someone going to be LaToya Jackson. <laughs> Even if you're a Jackson, doesn't mean you're going to act. You know what I mean? Or, or, you know, if you're a Van Peebles, doesn't mean you're going to act. So we're, we're kind of like the Jacksons, but we just don't have the talent. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel pressure following in your, your, your pop's footsteps? <clears throat> and uh, your grandfather? It's interesting, because that, that word, I don't, it, it, I don't feel pressure per se. Mm -hmm. um, I feel it's more like a resource I can tap into. Mm. Um, more so like, even even with the self tapes, the auditioning process, just having him around when I need him is great. Even when I'm out of town or not, um, not around, he can make time to even watch something, just mm -hmm. putting eyes on it. And and I think that's, yeah, not, not so much a pressure, but mm -hmm. a resource and kind of like, uh, Thank you, man. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> he really, he, he really mm -hmm. helps me out, and he wants to see me win. So, mm -hmm. there is, you know, an external pressure, maybe from people looking. I'm, ha I'm happy with myself. Mm -hmm. I could, I could make it and be happy, or I could, you know, be, have a restaurant and be happy. So, mm -hmm. really, I, I do this because I enjoy the craft. Growing up watching mm -hmm. him, basically support us, and we got a big family playing make believe. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty cool job. So. I've always kind of admired that, and um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a pressure. I would say it's a it's kind of a hope to to live up to that in a certain way. Mm. Ma Mario, for you, how, how important is it to continue the filmmaking lineage within your family by having your son in the film? Well, you know, I remember a certain point, my dad and I, I had I done a New Jack City, and then I did Posse, and the, and the movies were doing well. And Hollywood was sort of saying, what do you want to do next? When I went to do Posse after New Jack, the critics came after me and they said, oh, he's trying to make old Jack City. <laughs> <laughs> boys in the hood, boys in the saddle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, until they saw the movie. And then my dad said, what do you want to do next? I said, man, I want to do that because he had written a book on the Black Panthers. I said, I want to turn your book on the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense into a movie. And he said, they're not going to let us. Hollywood ain't ready for that. And we went to Hollywood to do it. And uh, he was right. And we had to get the funding independently. Mm -hmm. Because what they wanted, this was the craziest, they wanted one of the lead Black Panthers to be white. What? Oh my God. And they said, yeah, man, look, Dances with Wolves is not gonna star a Native American. You know, Rocky is not gonna star, you know, a brother. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just, at that point, you know, so I was like, oh, okay, I see what you're doing. The dominant culture has to see itself reflected in film in a dominant way, and you'll be the exotic backdrop. So we didn't do it, and we had to put the funding together a different way. But when we did that, uh, and I directed it and produced it, my dad wrote it and produced it, uh, and we didn't always agree, but you know, which it fell into his domain, I went his way, it fell into mine, we went my way. Um, he turned to me and he said, man, I love you, I like you, and I, and I admire that you're courageous, because we're doing stuff that we know is gonna be controversial because what we showed with Panther was kind of the prequel to New Jack City, was that it's not an accident that you can get drugs in almost every minority community in America. And guns. And guns. Guns of that and, level. And, and guns are not made in that community. Mm -hmm. You know, We don't make Uzis in the hood, we don't grow poppy fields in the hood. So how does it get there on a daily basis? And the minute you follow the money, it leaves black hands, brown hands, very quickly. And you realize, wow, they want us to be medicated. And that to a certain degree, that represents a self-cleaning oven, mm -hmm. right? So when we do that kind of film, you're like, whoa. And now Panther is a really hard movie to find. Like you, you, That's the one movie I made that it's like you can't find that movie. It don't even come up when you Google, or maybe I was tripping. I yeah. Googled just your films. Yeah. And I was now like, I, I know he did Panther. Yeah. But they don't come no, up. No, man. It's it like that, they, they, there was a, a right-wing organization that took out ads against it. It was like they just didn't want us to think. They they. They didn't want to. They don't want you to think about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You just stay in the hood, bopping your head, and you know, doing that, and don't think about why are the drugs here. You know, that's that's Malcolm stuff. Oh, there so, you go. so what happened was, um, 
Dad wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. First of all, he, Melvin wanted to be a tennis player, but he mm -hmm. sucked at tennis. Mm -hmm. He just wasn't good at it. So he said, oh, I, I want to be a writer. But then he said, he said he got out of writing to direct film, make film. I said, why, Daddy? He said, because folks weren't reading books enough. They were watching movies. So if in the future they go to some other medium and you want to reach the people, you want to reach the folks that are going to get out there and vote and change what tomorrow looks like, then maybe we have to move mediums. So it's not so important what the vehicle is, mm -hmm. but what is important is being a griot, telling our stories, right? Telling our stories wow. that, that mm -hmm. set us free, that, that make us go. And, and let me just say, you know, we're not really in the, in the business of brain science, brain surgery, but when apartheid fell, there were two favorite shows they were watching. Miami Vice with a white leading man and a black leading man, and The Cosby Show. And I'm not talking about the man, I don't wanna really litigate that, I'm talking about the phenomenon of the show. Of course. Mm -hmm. 20 years before there were the Obamas. It was the Cosby. It was the Huxtables. Huxtable, mm -hmm. yeah. Hey man. Now we got Modern Family and, and Will and Grace, whatever. It changes how we look at who you love and how you love, you feel me? So what's that quote, uh, I love to mess up this one, by Lincoln, he says, with public opinion on your side, you can do almost anything. Without mm -hmm. public opinion, it's very hard to get anything done. He who controls public opinion has more power than he or she who makes the laws. Mm -hmm. We're in the business of culture. I think culture can be healing. If you can make a Western, say, well, America made more Westerns than any other type of movie. But in most Westerns I saw growing up as a kid, I didn't see us, right? If you looked at a Western, you saw someone black, they were shuffling and not someone you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. There was a woman, she was pale, frail, and needed rescuing. If there was a Chinese guy, he was hop the houseboy. If there was a Mexican dude, he was the oily bandit who didn't need no stinking baches. Mm -hmm. And if there was a good, <laughs> only good Indian was a dead Indian. Mm -hmm. So you were kind of marginalized if you weren't a white guy. But I don't feel the need to, to, to diss nobody either, right? So we have like, we have some badass white characters in it because that was real, they were there. So I'm just not making reactionary film. Gotcha. Outlaw Posse is probably more representative of what the West looked like. And because of that, it feels revolutionary. I like reading reviews, you know, it's interesting. How, when you see critics, they say the film struggles with effectively managing the shifts between comedy and a more serious tone. And when I read that, I'm like, well, they don't know what it is to be black then. Right. Mm. Well, <laughs> well, here's the other thing. Our here's life the, is a dramedy. To, to, well, here's the other thing. That's how we survive too. Mm -hmm. Someone asked my daddy once, my dad all these answers, he said, he said, he said, how come you move so fast? Because he, he said, well, they killed all the slow ones. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy, why did, why did they get to the top? They didn't let me in at the bottom. But that's real in that the people that live the longest, centurions, people over 100, have one thing, three things in common. The first is sense of humor. Mm -hmm. We got all these great black comedians. Why? Great Jewish comedians, why? Because we both people went through trauma. trauma. Yeah. You go through trauma, you you either die or you laugh. Or right. you, and you and then hopefully you laugh and then you get up and make changes. I'm not saying I'm gonna be laughing. I'm still gonna get my ass up and make a movie that says something. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, and that because we believe is you know the three loves. What are the three loves, son? Tell uh, your dad. Love what you do. Mm -hmm. yep. So I got closer to the mic. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Love what you do. Love who you do it with and love what you say with it. There you go. Damn, mm -hmm. I'm good. And if those three chakras line up, <laughs> mm -hmm. then you're rich no matter what the paycheck is. Right. I was in, I was with dad on 56th Street. He had a place on 56th. We're walking down the street and his brother came up to us. He had long silver dreads. And he said, came up behind us. He said, excuse me, Mr. Van Peebles, I have to say I love your work. And we both turned around. We mm -hmm. didn't know who he was talking to. And he said, I am talking to both of y'all. I'm a fan, but I'm not a groupie. I have to let you know. Sometimes I go to the movies and I'm entertained. That's a good thing. Sometimes I go to the movies and I learn something new. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And every now and then I go to the movies and I come out proud to be a man of color. And that's a great thing. And with your movies, I get all three. Wow. Wow. How, how, how has the loss of your father impacted you personally and professionally? Um, it makes me enjoy doing shit like this. <laughs> you can. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was a clown. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, love to, I love to love him up. <laughs> yeah. That was like, I'm going to wrestle dad when I leave here. I yeah. want you to know that. He got me in. He got me in a little... A little lock the other day. Did well, he? yeah, yeah. He, I was like, oh, I just tapped I'm out to make. Like, I'm not stronger than him. I'm smarter, you know. <laughs> so I really just had to trick him. 
<laughs> he didn't want to go one way that I wanted him to go so he could open up his neck. So I was like, all right. I pushed him the other way. So he was closing. But then he just like, I'll open it up. And I, 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 <laughs> I got it. He locked me in. <laughs> he locked me in. This guy can roll. He could rumble. He could roll. You got a good ground game. Um, Don't hurt your pops now. Right, right, right. right. He, he pretty, but he got a good ground game. Um, you know what? What I miss is our conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> I'm, I mean, the, the, you know, because towards the end he had Alzheimer's and he was starting to fade, I could, we could sing songs together because that goes into a different part of the brain. Right. You know, when you learn music, I could hold his hand. He could see, he could know who I was. Mm -hmm. um, but I miss, I miss our conversations. Like conversations like this, for mm -hmm. real. Like where you can, and that's why I could be here all day talking. You'd be like, you're going to have to get me out of here because you'd be like, this Negro talks too much. Mm -hmm. But I miss having those good in-depth conversations. Mm -hmm. And that's again, something to go back to the movie that I wanted the movie to do was to have conversations with America that America's afraid to have with itself. Right. We're afraid to look at stuff and laugh and go, oh wow, I never looked at it that way. Mm -hmm. And do that collectively in a room with people that don't vote like you, think like you, act like you. That's important. If everyone around you looks and thinks like you, life will get boring. That's right. You know what I mean? You gotta challenge yourself, that's you know right. what I mean? So I missed that because Melvin, dude, I'm gonna tell you one. Uh, you got a moment to kind of, of take course, Okay, yeah. okay, so I'll tell you what I missed. This is one thing I missed. So dad had done sweet back and, and we had risked, we risked everything. All of our little family savings, I mean, everything. And then the movie blew up and he invited me and my sister out to LA to go to a party. And I was about 14, my sister was 13. We had like af beautiful afros. We, we look like the Jacksons again, mm -hmm. I'll go back mm -hmm. to that. And she had red hair. So we go to this party and it's a bat mitzvah. Now we didn't know what, the ba what a bat mitzvah was. Mm -hmm. And it was my, my dad's agent had this thing. So we go there and there are all these kids, mostly Jewish kids, standing around the dance floor, all shy, not wanting to dance, being a little timid. They had a DJ, they had a band, but wasn't nobody dancing. So me and my sister like, this is a party? Oh, they 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 don't know, right? And the floor would light up if you stepped on it. We like, oh, we, so we went out there like we were on Soul Train. We were tearing it up. They all started applauding us, and they came around and applauded. And my sister, my my sister and I were dancing, and my dad watching, and you never know what Melvin Van Peebles is going to think. And he signaled us over. And I said, I don't know what this guy's about to say. And we followed him into their library. This family had a McMansion, big old library. It looked mm -hmm. like something out of Beauty and the Beast. And Daddy took his cigar out and he said, uh, you know, <clears throat> I love y'all. Y'all are beautiful. And you dance like you're on Soul Train. But I feel sorry for you because you're going to miss out on half of, half of life. I said, what? And he said, yeah, man. He said, listen, we've got to love two things about people. you got to love who they are but you also gotta love who you are when you're with them, mm. right? Mm. And the way you're dancing on that floor, it's not inviting other people to dance with you. In fact, it's intimidating. It almost looks like a challenge. Like if they don't know the latest steps, don't have the perfect this or that, don't even bother coming out on the dance floor. Mm. So you're never gonna know what that tall Jewish brother is thinking right there. And I'm like, man, he's been to Auschwitz. And I said, Auschwitz what? And he said, exactly, you don't know. You're not gonna know what that little Asian girl's thinking. You're not gonna know. You're gonna miss out on half of life because you're not bringing out the beauty in others. And then he dropped the mic, and I was like, "Wow!" Me and my sister went back on the dance floor. I got the girl up. She got the old dude up. We got people involved. By the time we left, left, we had everyone up dancing, hanging out, having fun. And one of those guys at that party later on wound up funding one of my movies when I became an adult. Wow! Wow! And he said, "Good he must allies. Be the rug. Good allies come in all colors." Mm. You know, then the lesson was don't leave love on the table. Mm -hmm. Someone yeah. may not look like you or vote like you. Your strength is diversity. Get out mm -hmm. there and listen to what other people are doing. And sometimes you may learn something. You may go, oh, you know what? Let me try that. Mm -hmm. Let me try his workout or her workout. What's she doing? I need to know what they're doing. Wow. I, I, so he was such a curious, an intel, he had an intellectual curiosity that I miss. A lot of people, we're, we're happy if we, we just watch our own show with our own news facts and we just want to see stuff that confirms what we already think. Right. But the strength is, did you learn a new word today? Man, I agree so much, man. That's why I was even, when, when, I, when I brought up the New Jack City reference on, on, uh, with Jonathan Carter, that's what I was in ref reference to because I was saying how 
the vice president needs to go mix it up on Fox News. Right. The way Obama totally. used to go sit down Absolute. with O'Reilly. Like, Dude, I want to do that with this one. I was like, yeah. you know, put me on Fox News. Let me That's get right. them. They see Westerns. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know? And once you hear it, once you, listen, somebody came up to me from Fox News once. I think it was a, it was a right-wing radio station. It was after 9-11. And I was with my kids. And, and they were like, what do you think of 9-11? I said, well, listen, first of all, well, he said, what do black people think of 9-11? I said, dude, I can only answer for me. I don't represent black people. I can only represent my own crazy idea. But let me just say this. If you have children, and my eldest daughter says, I'm going to hit my brother because he hit me, my first question as a thinking father would be, did you do anything that might make your brother want to hit you? Mm -hmm. Before I condone you're hitting him back. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Before you get into a military stance with your brother, did he? Did you do anything to him that might provoke him? Okay, why'd he hit you? Right? That's a simple, that, that, and that's a Republican or Democrat. And I said, we got hit in 9-11. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we framed it as not patriotic to ever ask the question, is there anything being done abroad that might make folks want to hit us? Mm. And the minute you look at that, the minute you go, oh, wow, why is this going down over here? Why is that? And you have to look at it. You go, oh, there's usually some, 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 something to it. Mm -hmm. It's not just people just hate you randomly. You know, it's like you got to kind of look at what's going on. And when you look around, like that thing I was telling you about Cartagena, where they say, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll take you. You just have to take our Coca-Cola and our gods and our this and our that. And then you can have your freedom. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think what I, what I miss is Melvin's intellectual curiosity. And, and, and that was, a lot of that came through travel. Mm -hmm. Seeing how if you travel around, people that you will see, oh, wow, they're doing the same thing we do. Or they, do, they look at it a different way. And you learn a lot when you travel. So part of it is like, and this dude is always traveling. He's been there. That's he was he was teaching in Africa, man. And wow. when he was a kid, you know, got bit by a lion, right? So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I got I got two more questions about uh, outlaw policy. Was the disconnect between the chief's public and private identity done on purpose to humanize him? How do you mean? Like was it just done on like with with. Did you separate the identities, his public, how he was in public as, as opposed to personal with his family? Did you do that to, to humanize him more? I, uh, well, he, well, he has, yes. I mean, I, I don't know if I did it directly to humanize him. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about that Johnny Cash song, The Boy Named Sue, where he grows up, like there's a great quote by mm -hmm. Mark Twain where he says, all my life my father was an idiot, but at 21 he was a genius, mm -hmm. meaning that I got old enough to understand what he was doing. So part of what I wanted in the father-son dynamic was an evolutionary vibe where you go, oh, now I've spent time with the cat. Now I understand mm -hmm. why he did what he did. But you wouldn't understand it younger. You know, man, just like when, in my life, I didn't always like Melvin Van Peebles, especially early on. I thought he was a paternal fascist. Mm. But later on when I said, man, I want to act. And there were no good roles as an actor. So I said, these roles are terrible. You know, I'm getting offered thug one, two, and three, and it's not working. Mm -hmm. So I guess I got to write. So I, who, who's going to teach me how to write? I went to Melvin Van Peebles. I wrote this first script. It was a great script. Gave it to my dad. He said, eh, it's a piece of shit. Dang. I said, what do you mean? It needs work? He said, nope, you can't polish the turd, son. <laughs> like, he was hardcore. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I got better, better, better. Then I went to get the script done. Couldn't get a director. So mm -hmm. I said, well, I guess I'll learn to direct. And each step that I took, I had to go back to him and learn more. And finally, at the end, I realized he had equipped me. My mom showed me the mountain, and he equipped me to, to learn how to carry, climb the mountain. Wow. So, yes, there were separations in it with Chief's you know, public and private persona, but they're, they're connected. It's not like he doesn't. It's, it's not, you know, I, I tried this in life, that the Mario I am is at least friends with the Mario I try to be. That then them two jokers are not in separate rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I'm never gonna be as cool as I, I as I'd like to be, mm -hmm. you know, but but they're close. You know what I mean? Where I go, and especially as you get older, you get more like, man, I'm just gonna be myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because you project that strength and authority in public, but sometimes you find difficulty with meeting that expectation in your house. Totally. But, and, and here's the thing: the cleaner you get with it, and this is what I mean by that, the more that your dreams and aspirations become your words. 
And then your words become your deeds. And then your deeds become your actions. Then the more you affect your reality in an immediate way, mm. right? So thoughts become your words, words become your deeds, your deeds become your actions. And so I find that, and there's always a gap, but I find the more that I go, like even this morning, like this guy, he'll say, he'll say okay, dad, like, like last night, he'll be like, okay, let's get 100 in. So we do, we're going to go eat. We're going to go eat. It's late. We just flew in from LA, but we're going to do 100 push-ups before we go. You know what I mean? So we were just like, but I have to go before lazy Mario starts to go, well, you know, I really should make a phone call. Or maybe I didn't stretch <laughs> enough because that Negro will slow me down. I have to get up and go quick before his lazy ass gets up. So I realize they're different Marios and it just depends on which one I want to listen to. Gotcha. You know, I, I got I just want you, you finish the last question. Shalom. Yes, sir. My last question. Good questions, by the way, man. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Um, New Jack City. Yes, sir. You traumatized me for a long time. <laughs> Why did the light skinned brother have to get stabbed in the hand? <laughs> I loved it. This was, a, this was a question that Will Smith brought up. Why did the light skinned <laughs> brother, you, you traumatized me for a long time. I never did like scene. you anyway. <laughs> One of the greatest scenes in cinema history. <laughs> you know what? You know what? It was just, I, I, I wanted to just, when I make a film, I want to just let it rip. And there were scenes with Wesley, for real, Wesley and Alan Payne. And Alan Payne's in Outlaw Posse. Mm -hmm. And there were scenes, because we laughed and talked about it, where they just did their thing. And I had the good sense as a director to get the hell out the way, no ego, and go, man, they got magic. Let me just film the magic. You know what I mean? Uh, and there was just moments that Wesley would do stuff and we like, oh, that just works. It'd be killing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I still look back at when I watch that movie and think, man, that's one of his baddest roles, man. Mm -hmm. he, he tore it up. He really inhabited the role. I mean, yeah, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> Traumatizing. Mean, uh, yeah, and, and, and I'm not going to say nothing, but you'll see some reference to that. <laughs> I was just thinking Yeah, I know that. you will. I know would you, you will. ever reboot that? I always that? thought you and Alan was related. Right. All light skin people ain't related, man. Man, I don't even look at them as light skin, but I just always thought y'all yeah, was related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting because there's a reason for that too. In Outlaw Posse, <laughs> okay, okay. all roads lead back to mm -hmm. it. I'm not okay. Gonna, so, so yeah, and Alan has a great vibe. Like we we hang now during the, you know, it's like you. Well, the good thing is like the guy that's the same at 20 as he is at 40 didn't grow much. You know what I mean? You got, and so the more we grow as man, the more we've gotten closer. And going, man, they you saw this, and I and I can see that, and and Alan's so smart and thoughtful, and he's good in this movie. Man, he did some stuff in this movie that's wild. Um, so I'd be proud to be. I, I'm I'm his cinematic brother. <laughs> Absolutely. Word. All right. Well, we appreciate you, brothers, for joining us. Outlaw Posse is out March first. Yeah, that's man. right. And Mario it, Mandela Van Peebles. What were we gonna say? I was just gonna say that again because we're an independent film. You're not going to see huge billboards everywhere. It's word of mouth. So right. people can go on my Instagram, Mario Van Peebles. I'm easy to find or, you know, and, and, and see it. But it's going to be March 1st. But it won't be at every theater. So you got to okay. go out and make it happen. All right. You know what I mean? Check your local listings. That's right. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Wake that ass up. Early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.